your welcome to the World Kidney Day. And the theme of this World Kidney Day is uh, Kidney Health for All. So preparing for the unexpected, supporting the vulnerable. The year 2023 has been declared as Kidney Health for All, preparing for the unexpected, supporting the vulnerable. The 2023 campaign will focus on raising awareness about the disaster, uh, this disastrous event, nature or uh, man-made, international or local, and the impact on people living with kidneys whose access to appropriate diagnostic services, treatment, and care is hindered. Non-communicable diseases, as we all know, which include cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, cancer, hypertension, chronic lung diseases, and chronic kidney diseases, they are known to be the leading causes of death and disabilities worldwide. Significantly so in the low and middle income countries like ours. In the event of the emergencies, the cohort of the community is among the most vulnerable in the population due to their ongoing requirements for consistent uh, coordinated care, which is often lifelong and involves complex ongoing treatment. Dear viewers, I'm uh, Dr. Rakesh Gupta, President of Cypher and former Director of Health Services Punjab. We welcome you all for this very special edition of Cypher Health News Channel. And as I told you, it is being released on the World Kidney Day. Uh, we feel honored to have with us an eminent public health expert, Dr. Ravi Manrotra. He's founder of Center for Health Innovation and Policy, CHIP Foundation. Uh, and he is also founder CEO of the ICMR India Cancer Research Consortium. You are welcome, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Rakesh. It's a pleasure being uh, with you. So, uh, Dr. Ravi, uh, he is the founder of Center for Cell Health Innovation and Policy, as it is called as CHIP Foundation. And, and uh, as I told you, he is also founder of CEO of the ICMR India Cancer Research Consortium. Uh, he did his post graduation, MD from University of uh, Allahabad. Motilal Nehru Medical College, Ifil from University of Allahabad, and uh, FRC Path from Royal College of Pathology. Uh, Chip Foundation, Associate Healis uh, Saxeria Institute of Public Health, and he's also affiliate of the Cancer Foundation of India. He is visiting professor, School of Health Sciences, University of York, UK, member council of advisors on science and technology, open health sciences lab, uh, USA, members scientific council of WHO, IERC, Lyon, France. He is subject matter expert, International Agency for Research on Cancer, uh, extraordinary professor, Pan African Cancer Research Institute, Pretoria, South Africa. So you are welcome, sir. And uh, you, sir. So, yeah, and we we'll like to ask you about your uh, early education and your higher education days. Uh, Dr. Gupta, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for having me on this show. And uh, it's also the World Kidney Day, as you mentioned, which is, uh, I think, a very appropriate uh, event to commemorate. So. Uh, Although I have been working in non-communicable diseases for a long time, just to take you part of my journey, I did my medicine from the Armed Forces Medical College in Pune. And uh, after uh, graduating from there, I decided to pursue pathology as a, a speciality being the mother of all medicine. So we thought I was curious to know what is the actual causes of disease and what can be diseases earlier. Because, uh, and somehow I also got involved, my MD thesis was on diagnosis of breast cancer and ovarian cancer. So cancer has somehow always been uh, very prominent in the area that I wanted to work on right from the days when I was a postgraduate. And uh, following that, I had a stint to work, uh, got a chance to work in New Zealand at the Christchurch Hospital. Christchurch, uh, you might be aware, is we know it at that time at least only for uh, cricket. 
where New Zealand and Australia were a very prominent cricket team. So I landed up in Christchurch on a fellowship from the Birla Memorial Trust in Bombay on a princely sum of those days of $500 per month for a period of one year to work on oncology and clinical oncology. And uh, that is where my postgraduate training also helped in uh, helping me in focusing on early diagnosis of cancer. So I spent three years there uh, as a house surgeon. Uh, in those days, they used to be called the senior house officers and uh, registrar and then uh, acting consultant for a few years. And uh, I came back to India, dabbled in oncology practice for a little while, but then the call of uh, teaching actually caught my attention and I joined the medical college uh, in my hometown of Alabad, uh, where I so on to become a professor and uh, head of the department uh, at various medical colleges in the state. And there I got a chance to further my interest as far as oncology is concerned because all my postgraduates uh, were very well aware that if you are they're going to work with me, chances are they will be working in the area of oncology and they will also be working in the area of early diagnosis. Um, I had two postgraduates with me at that time I used to teach about 100 undergraduates and of course I was taking part in the, the routine clinical laboratory as well as research. At that moment uh, when I, I got a chance to get various fellowships and uh, awards as well as research grants from not only the Department of Biotechnology but also CSIR, Department of Science Technology and that helped me very much because we got a chance to get uh, not only MD, MS students from pathology, but also from various other specialties, including auto ranology, basically the EMT department. And uh, since in that part of this country of ours, uh, tobacco related cancers are very common. And tobacco related, the most common thing that we saw was uh, oral potentially malignant disorders. Uh, they're specifically looking at leukoplakia and more so oral submucous fibrosis, which is a uh, fairly common oral potentially malignant disease in that part of the country in, in India and actually in most parts of the country, including the Northeast as well as the South. So uh, most of my research actually focused on uh, the diagnosis of these diseases, how we can use a very simple uh, technology of finding cells. So we, I became uh, known for my work in oral cytology and to see if we can just do a scraping with the brush and be able to diagnose infections or potentially malignant diseases as well as cancers by a very low cost and appropriate technology for India. Uh, but however, and uh, my students were also helped me and I must thank all my colleagues uh, professional colleagues, uh, my seniors, my contemporaries in the various departments, as well as uh, we could do uh, some epidemiological work. And that is how I got first exposed to a public health in a really practical way of how we can actually look at what is the epidemiology, what is the spread. And we also started a cancer registry to see where we can uh, make some sort of uh, clinical epidemiological correlation. And uh, every year we have to have the Magmela or the uh, at the Sangam of the river Ganga and Jamna and every 12 years for the Kummela and that provides us with a little microcosm of the entire population. And there also the use of smokeless tobacco that is uh, Zarda, Khaini, Gutka and also a local uh, product which was handmade and very easily available called the Dohra. Later on, I went and wrote up an article about Dohra as well, which is a combination of slake lime and 
chewing tobacco to that how we started our interest and gradually i started getting interested in how we can uh, inform the tobacco chewers hopefully help them to cessation as well as how we can diagnose the lesions earlier preventing obviously a lot of morbidity and mortality dr gupta what happened was that sparked the curiosity and i got the opportunity to represent the country in various fora dealing with tobacco and oral cancer so we wrote a book on oral cytology i my students and myself and many of my colleagues we were lucky to be involved at the national level as well as the international level in this area about 10 years ago i got uh, the opportunity to work uh, apply to the indian council of medical research which was looking for a leadership position at at that time it used to be called the indian uh, the institute of cytology and preventive oncology in short it was icpo which is a combination of cytology and oncology so that piqued my interest and uh, i applied for that position and i told my interview panel that uh, it will uh, i have a interest of course i am a cytopathologist by training and i have a interest in prevention of of uh, cancer so i think i may be the right person for this position uh, fortunately they did listen to me and uh, i joined uh, about 10 years ago as i mentioned in 2012 and um to the game or there i could uh, interact not only with uh, students uh, postgraduates um, and patients but also try and influence and formulate the policy for the country uh, being in delhi being the department of health research institution we could we went later on to rename it as a national institute of cancer prevention and research nicpr which i think you are more uh, familiar yeah. Uh, yeah we had the opportunity to host you and at various fora yeah. so i joined that and gradually we uh, rebuilt that team because uh, for various reason there was a lack uh, of continuity in leadership uh, before i joined but we could uh, with the help of many organizations including WHO including the US National Cancer Institution and of course uh, various bodies from uh, All India Institute and PGI Chandigarh where uh, uh, we have had a very close collaboration uh, we could all get together and uh, formulate the policy for the early diagnosis of cancer so we made the framework for cancer control and uh, Um, this is 2016 and the honorable prime minister actually uh, announced that we should have this policy within 3 months and with the help of the ministry of health uh, my colleagues at the department of health research and icmr and huge number of experts from practically around the world we could uh, at least put it in writing so that the compendium came out and we were tasked with the idea of training people in this these areas and the three common cancers were oral breast and cervical which is practically 40% of all cancers and many of them are preventable especially the oral and cervical so that is the time when um uh, more friends and colleagues helped me out and we could uh, the echo platform which is the extension for community health outcomes based out of albuquerque in uh, new mexico they were starting uh they are working in india as the echo india trust so we collaborated with them we started various training programs i think at that time we could train more than 4000 individuals uh, both uh, physicians dentists in addition to ayurvedic uh, ayush doctors as well as paramedical care personnel for capacity building and gradually more and more of my own attention was being focused the uh, global knowledge hub on smokeless tobacco was uh, the responsibility was given to us and my colleagues at uh, the institute as well as various organizations um, around the world including many in the us and the uk uh, helped us and uh, we formed this uh, hub as an, as well as a website focusing on smokeless tobacco till that time smoke in the west at least and uh, the tobacco mean meant cigarettes 
But then when in South Asia, practically we found that 70 to 80 percent of tobacco uh, is the smokeless variety. Right? We became a very sought after entity. And at the same time, the government of India was also looking at establishing uh, tobacco testing laboratories. And unfortunately, in India at that time, um, the very few facilities were available. So the government formed three testing laboratories. Uh, one in uh, the Apex Center was at, in, 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 in the NCR in Noida at our institute. Then there was another one in Bombay and another in Guwahati. We were given the job of procuring all the equipment, extracting the quality control. And that was the first uh, three. And now I believe uh, Nimhans Bangalore is also added. So there are four tobacco testing laboratories as of today. And that has meant a sea change because it, the, earlier the manufacturers could claim that uh, their product did not contain tobacco or they were within um, uh, the limits as far as a particular chemical or particular ingredient is concerned. So now that has changed because now we have the facility for measuring um, those particular ingredients that be. So at the same time, we were also given the uh, onus uh, the power was on us to see how we can actually look at the diagnosis of other uh, diseases, including breast cancer and cervical cancer. Mm -hmm. So, the, as you know, for cervical cancer, now the WHO has also come up with a program of uh, 1970, 90, basically approved, uh, prevent 90%, uh, diagnose 70, and treat 90%. So, uh, human papilloma virus research had been done for a long time at the institution. We could actually further that and come up and try out uh, clinical trials of uh, how we can diagnose HPV using a low cost PCR or the polymerase chain reaction test, uh, which is appropriate for our country nearly point of care. So we published that and uh, my colleagues uh, were very, uh, they were proactive and they were very, very uh, helpful in, in, in helping the government not only make the policies, but also to implement those policies. So we were also given a job to get HPV vaccination, which you know, right now it is the hot topic. Yeah. So, so five years ago, we could actually get together a round table and get the HPV vaccine started by the governments of three different states, including one where you are, where Punjab was um, very aggressive thing, and so was the Delhi state. The Delhi State Cancer Institute and the Punjab government, these are the two within a week of each other, they started the HP vaccination. Punjab started in two districts, and yeah. Delhi was uh, based in a hospital called the Delhi State Cancer Institute, while the Punjab uh, scheme was school based. And I think you were very much part of that program, I remember, so many years yeah, exactly. ago. Yeah. And very shortly, uh, I think another year or two, we were able to uh, convince, along with my partners from uh, not only WHO, the ministry, and various other international and national organizations to a smaller state, but very progressive state of Sikkim to start. And they are the only ones who are actually, even today, continuing uh, with the HPV vaccine. At the same time, we were asked uh, to help out become a trial center for the Indian-made vaccine from the Serum Institute. Unfortunately, the COVID struck and, you know, that uh, plan went for a toss. Other uh, centers did continue. And now that hopefully COVID is behind us, uh, we are hoping to start by the middle of this year of uh, the SurveyVac, which is the uh, HPV vaccine made by the Serum Institute, provided at a very, very low cost to the government as part of the immun universal immunization program. So they, these are the things which I'm very proud of, that we could actually uh, further the cause. We published, we worked, we took part in seminar. Advoca we went for advocacy uh, to the government and to various policymakers around the country, around the world, that we should be self-reliant. And we had a small role to play as far as HPV vaccine is concerned. We had a relatively more uh, important, at least in our view, important role to play as far as coming up with a framework for control of cancer, looking at 
how the various states will be including what equipment in the PIP, how we are going to go for training, how we are going to evaluate uh, those programs as part of the national health mission. And at the same time, also look at training and retraining of these individuals. So I must thank all my colleagues, all my uh, students, all my uh, bosses at that time at ICMR and many other organizations who would were part of my journey till that uh, that area. Over the last year, uh, maybe two, we have uh, now I have uh, superannuated for the government. In between uh, the directorship of NICPR and now, I did take up the CEO position of the India Cancer Research Consortium, which was a consortium that was planned to bring all the major cancer research bodies in the country within its ambit and to make sure that the research findings are translated. So we were again very lucky to have got a reasonable amount of money and up to five crores per research proposal we could give uh, to at least 10 bodies, uh, 10 of them, including PGI Chandigarh and um, many other, even NGOs. There were two NGOs we could actually give a reasonable amount of money. We could give money to the Sikkim government to work on HPV uh, diagnosis along with the HPV vaccine. And uh, that program is still continuing. So about two years ago, I, so I left that and now I'm uh, with this uh, CHIP uh, Foundation that is the Center for Health, Innovation and Policy. And at the same time, we are trying to continue with the work along with our partners. Uh, now we have also part, become a part of the Healthy India Alliance. We are part of, uh, we are trying to get into the recognized body as far as various national and international organizations are concerned. And we are very keen uh, that uh, we can uh, soon be able to make a dent as far as public health is concerned. Yeah. So, I mean, I can probably go on for many hours, but I'm sure we do not have the time for that. But Maybe we can all part yeah. at some point. But it has been a very, very satisfying journey. I hope we, it is like a drop in the ocean what we've been able to achieve. And I think the key point that I wanted to bring across, uh, Dr. Rakesh, was Collaboration and networking is really what yeah. is, uh, and most people are now getting more and more tuned to the idea that oh, many of us are working in the area of public health. We are trying to uh, put our might, but if we join forces with like-minded organizations, there is no dearth of money in this country. There is no dearth of talent in the country. The What we really lack is working together. And that is what my experience has been. The moment we got our national uh, partners and we saw that we have no conflict of interest with any of them. We are really, actually, we all bring our own strengths and unfortunately weaknesses also. We are all human. So as an organization also, it is the same story. But if we have two, three, four, five organizations which are like-minded, we can build on each other's strength. We can learn from their failures. We can learn from their successes and replicate it in our own uh, situation as we go further. And I'm sure uh, that is what is happening. And I uh, congratulate uh, Cypher and his colleagues um, and his well-wishers for the kind of uh, good work that I've been seeing over the years. I have been involved uh, myself in many of your programs and I look yeah. forward to a continued collaboration as well as a continued work uh, going forward. Yeah. And uh, I must uh, thank you for uh, letting us know about your graduation days and post-graduation days and your work as a pathologist, psych uh, cytologist, your work in um, smokeless tobacco, your uh, work on breast cancer, oral cancer, precancerous lesions, and that is great. I think uh, AFMC graduation that uh, uh, built a very strong foundation for you. Um, because AFMC is a great institute to, uh, I mean, uh, so since you have graduated from AFMC, it is a great thing. And uh, you also told about your uh, special initiatives in ICPR and uh, uh, as uh, in charge of the SLT hub. And as we all know that uh, oral cancers, 90% of the oral cancers are because of the smokeless tobacco. So thanks a lot. And uh, your work on those tobacco, uh, tobacco labs. So that is also a great initiative. And now we know that we have uh, four tobacco testing labs uh, in India. 
So, Dr. Ravi, it was nice uh, learning from you about your journey as a graduate, then as a postgraduate, as a cytologist, as a pathologist, mm -hmm. and uh, your initiatives as uh, director of NICPR and in charge of the SLT Hub. So, now we'd we'll like to know about your message for the young public health specialists. Well, in addition to what I mentioned, Dr. Gupta, about collaboration and working with others rather than trying to be a solo worker, what I would really like to say as far as public health is concerned, that we should be focusing on the low-hanging fruit, that is what is easily available and appropriate to our population. You see, for example, if I take the uh, diagnosis of cancer, right? So, I mean, we have all the latest biomarkers, we have uh, the latest genomic studies, but it is not really available to the masses. So, yeah. my approach to my, and my advice to all my younger colleagues and students has always been, see what is practicable in your situation. I am a cytopathologist, so most cancers can actually be diagnosed, at least they can be excluded by... Um, cytology. For example, you take a case of a lymph node, which is the most common presentation for most uh, malignancies. And uh, in our country, unfortunately, in spite of all the efforts that the government and our folks have been doing, tuberculosis is the most rampant. And it is very often that a tubercular lymph node is confused for lymphoma or a tubercular lymph node is confused for a, a malignant uh, lesion or a secondary form of cancer. So go for investigations which are appropriate, which are low cost, ideally, but sometimes you have to go for a CT scan, sometimes you have to go for a PET scan, but 80% and more can be actually dealt just by the appropriate investigation. And then when we're looking at the individual for treatment purposes, always be on the lookout as what is the cost of the investigation? What are the side effects? I mean, it's a fundamental rule, but I don't think I have to repeat, that the disease should never be, uh, the treatment should never be worse than the disease, yeah. right? Yeah. So, I mean, we have to look at the pocket end of the individual, we have to look at the general condition. For a 90 plus year old individual, if you're going for aggressive therapy, the chances are that there will be a lack of compliance. And also if the person is, not in a very strong financial position, they will take one or two rounds of a chemotherapy or whatever treatment, radiotherapy, and then they'll give away. And always treat the patient the way you would treat your own near and dear. Suppose it is your own, one of your parents is there or one of your brother's siblings is there. That is the approach. I'm sure things are improving. Now with the latest National Medical Com Commission has also come up with a training in empathy and communication. So I'm very hopeful that uh, our medical professionals, whether it is doctors, dentists, and paramedical and support staff, the amount of empathy that is going to be shown to the individuals is more. And also, once you start a program, whether it is a research program or it is an implementation program, make sure that there is the political will, the finance, as well as the capacity to make it sustainable. If you start a very fancy program and it finishes in one year and then everybody is left in the lurch, you would be in trouble. Yeah. If you diagnose a disease, whether it is hypertension, it is a kidney disease, or it is diabetes, make sure that the person is investigated appropriately and also followed up as far as treatment is concerned. There is, is it better not to diagnose something and leave the person um, in the lurch, but diagnose it, make sure that that individual is properly followed up. These are the sort of two, three things which I have learned in my uh, journey of uh, a few decades now in public health. And I really feel that uh, more and more people are getting aware of it. And I must congratulate Cypher and all his colleagues in uh, being able to give me the opportunity and the other colleagues the opportunity to uh, share our journeys, share our travails as well as our successes and failures with them thank you so much once again and also uh, on the occasion a, in fact it is a very appropriate message for the public health specialists and even for the clinicians that uh, because uh, we have very limited resources in our country so practicability is very important and we must go for very low cost investigations and treatment and that is really good and so um, 
since it is a world kidney day so what is your message on this day well i think the theme for the 2023 uh, world kidney day is very appropriate and they talk about uh, preparing for the unexpected anything can happen so be be aware of uh, all the intricacies of uh, things that can go wrong and right now unfortunately as you as you have seen the earthquake in uh, turkey and syria uh, anything any time can go wrong and unfortunately patients with chronic diseases including kidney diseases obviously uh, can be in real trouble or the covid pandemic that just showed us that uh, how the ncds uh, whether it is cardiovascular diabetes or kidney um, they there were so many challenges as far as the health uh, infrastructure was concerned that is already aggravated the insufficient global political health commitment towards ncds but preparation for unexpected is important and what we really need is the policy makers adopting integrated health strategies these yeah. healthcare services should be equitable in providing uh, access government should be including emergency preparedness plans which i'm sure they are and individual should also be looking at emergencies by uh, keeping the emergency kit including food water and medicines appropriately because even getting medicines if the shops are closed what do you do so yeah. i think uh, that's a very appropriate uh, message and the theme for this year's uh, um, kidney day and that is prepare for the unexpected as well as support the vulnerable it and vulnerable unfortunately there are so many whether it is the elderly it is the indigent and people who are do not have as much um, education or as much uh, support as many of us do so i think that's a that's an excellent way to uh, not only for kidney i would say the same thing is true for any chronic disease so uh, my my best is uh, to all pray we come towards a healthier country and a healthier world as we go forward thanks a lot sir and uh, i'll uh, this is a very appropriate message for the world kidney day and i'll also request my colleagues in the public health to go and watch your tech talk it, i just watched it the tech talk on youtube and i think they must watch and uh, be motivated so thanks a lot for being with us and uh, having an informal talk with us for sector health you thank I you i hope uh, i hope you had as much fun uh, conducting this yeah. talk as i had in delivering yeah. it and i look forward to positive interactions going forward yeah thank you thank you dr roy thank, thank you. you so thank much you. dr rakesh it's always a pleasure bye bye yeah thank you bye Hello and welcome to Doc Plexus Health Minute. An advisory group to the United States Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has affirmed the lack of evidence to recommend more than one COVID-19 booster per year for older people and those with weakened immune systems. The CDC advisers have not yet released new recommendations for how the COVID-19 shots should be administered. Should older and immunocompromised people be recommended frequent booster shots despite the lack of evidence? Share your views by commenting below. The US FDA has issued an emergency use authorization for the first over-the-counter test that can differentiate and detect influenza A and B and SARS-CoV-2. The single-use at-home test kit can provide results from self-collected nasal swab samples in just 30 minutes. A study has found that pioglitazon, a drug used for treating diabetes, can now help reduce the risk of dementia. The study examined over 90,000 patients newly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes who did not have dementia. After 10 years, 8% of the patients taking pioglitazon developed dementia, compared to 10% of those who were not on pioglitazon. The World Health Organization has expressed concern over the human to human transmission of bird flu after the father of a Cambodian girl who died due to H5N1 tested positive. If bird flu transmission is confirmed to have taken place between humans, appropriate measures will be implemented as a priority. To gain insights into advanced device-based therapies for heart failure, Join the reputed interventional cardiologist Dr. Pravin Shri Kumar in our exclusive Clean Shots today 6 p.m. IST onwards. For the latest medical updates from across the globe, stay tuned to Doc Plexus Health Minute. Happy Doc Plexing.